The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Rickley and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Daniel and Jen, uh, both from Modern New Financial Planners. Uh, somewhat last minute agreed to uh, to join me today for for recording an episode. Daniel, you've uh, been on the podcast before, but Jen, this is your first time. So welcome to, to both of you. It's a pleasure to, to have some time to speak with you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, James. That's all right. As we as we tend to do, you know, with a lot of these podcasts, we tend to you know go go back a little bit and talk about kind of the the, the story of how I guess each of you got into financial advice and and, and the ro- the different roles that you're playing within the financial advice space right now and and some of the ins and outs of of your business. Um, Daniel, maybe we'll start with you. We'll uh, we'll spend most of the time trying to speak with Jen, but Daniel, maybe start with start with you. Tell us about Modern New Financial Planners. What's the, what's the story there? Yep. So Modern New began um, basically off the, after the Royal Commission. Uh, I was in a stage in a situation where there's a lot of structure and things changing with different businesses and everything. It got to the point where I, I had this vision of my own. I'd just done the AFA Rising Star, um, met Chris, met Victoria, ever all the great people from there early, and I just thought, you know, it's time for me to be to bring in my own part to the profession like my own vision and everything so uh, one day it was literally like Jerry Maguire that just everything fell on the post and within 15 minutes I'd walked out with uh, absolutely nothing and just a dream and that vision and that's when what you began yep and what what what's involved in in that you know you get I speak to a lot of people in a whole lot of different businesses but what, what's involved in that stepping out of okay I'm an employed financial advisor at the moment like What's what's the first thing you need in setting up your own business? Where do you even start? The same cliche, James. You, the best way to say is you need to start with a why. You've really got to have a purpose of why you're going to do it. It, it takes a lot to um, actually go out of that comfort zone. And there are days that you know people think, why are we doing this? Is It's not going anywhere. Why don't we go back to employment? But when you've got a why, when you've got a sense of purpose, um, it's the first thing you absolutely need. And go around to the business and you know, take that step into the unknown. I think I was fortunate because uh, before I became in the industry, before I became a employed planner, I was actually an entrepreneur. So I'd actually ran a few businesses before. They were very successful businesses. I just wanted to change a career. Uh, so I already had the basic knowledge and tools. Um, but if you, you go out on your own, it's always good to find that network of people that can actually help you get those tools and that art. Uh, Find a good mentor and learn from their mistakes. Don't make their mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And Jen, how, how about you? So, you, so you work in the in the modern new financial planning business. What's what's your bit of backstory to to where you've gotten to where you are at the moment? Um. So, my financial planning journey started um, when my youngest turned two, and my husband asked me what I wanted to do when he went to school. Um, I already had a, a diploma in accounting and. But I didn't enjoy that field and I had experience in bookkeeping but no qualifications. So I'm basically starting from scratch. But I'm a numbers nerd and a bit of a geek and I like analysing things. So I found myself listening to podcasts by a, an influential American finance guru and sort of memorised his steps to financial freedom and paid off the debt and got an emergency fund and then got into um, 
investing and how do I do that? And his advice was quite wisely, go find a financial advisor. And I got to that stage and realized, you know what? I don't want to find a financial advisor. I want to be one. Yeah, that's incredible. So, um, yeah, it's, that was in um, early 2019, just after the financial standards changed. So I was looking up on the FPA website as to how to get into the field because no one wants to do more work than they have to. And I realized that my diploma was actually the key to getting back into uni, both with through CQU, so I could cash in the diploma for enrollment into the bachelor. And yeah, that was in March 2020. I started doing my bachelor. Yeah, right. So then COVID. So, <laughs> so was that so was that all when your youngest was at school? So you, you weren't doing that with 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 young children at home or, or your work yeah, like so with, what my youngest was? started kindergarten in twenty twenty. Okay. Yep. So that was the plan. He's gone to school. Let's go get stuck into this. And then, yep, <laughs> all that happened. So, yes, I was studying four units at home with two kids at home, doing schooling at home. Yep. Yeah. Four, yes. units at a, four units at a time or you did that four units my... over that COVID period? So I did four units in my first semester. That's amazing. That's full-time university. That is full-time and I had no <laughs> idea what I was getting myself in for. Yeah. Um, my husband called me up at the end of that unit at the end of that semester and said, "You're not doing that again." So we we turned it back to three. <laughs> so I've done my my whole degree over three and a half years. Okay, I was going to say you finished it. Now you have. Yep. I finished in June. Yep. Good on you. And so, where are you at in terms of the professional year then? So I was approved to start my professional year in March this year. So I was still finishing uni and I'm doing it part time, about forty percent through my first quarter. And how? Hey, we- what about your first role in financial advice? Like, is is working in for modern new financial plan? Is it was is that your first role in financial advice? Yeah, basically, um, I met Daniel through CQU. He was um, one of my he he marked several of my assignments. He was my lecturer for my capstone financial planning unit, um, financial planning construction. Yeah, I, I was quite taken by his uh, his teaching styles and his ability to communicate very clearly and I thought he was brilliant that he'd make an awesome mentor. So once I finished that unit, I sort of approached him about whether it'd be possible to start working with him at Modern New. And yeah, I started casually in January this year as a sort of a client services officer, a power planner, just learning the back office. And then in March... Is it before I was approved by Interprac to start my professional year? Yeah, good on you. And, and Daniel, what what does the business look like from a you know, bums on seats in, in in different roles? Like, how how many people are there? Is it just the two of you? Is there more? Like, what what does it what's it look like? So, predominantly, we've got one on the books on start. Uh, we've got somebody that takes over doing all the filing every few many hours CSO role. Uh, we've still got um, my son who has actually came into the business for a while. He still helps me with the back house and. Anything behind the scenes. He uh, was a broker for us for a while, and then we closed the under division to focus purely on financial planning. And when Jen came on board, uh, we just had a, she has a natural pa- um, passion to be a financial planner, a natural talent to pick everything up. And we thought, well, maybe it's time to get another advisor. So we're slowly taking over the entire East Coast of Australia. <laughs> but we'll like it. So, so Jen will be once Jen finishes her PY, Jen will be the second advisor in the business. So, so Daniel, there's there's you and and so then you'll end up with the two advisors. Is that right? Or you've got another one at the moment? Uh, so it'll be just the two advisors. Just yeah. the two. Yep, yep. Now you're you uh, don't work out of the same office or or live terribly close <laughs> to each other. Where 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 are you both located? So I'm in Bundaberg. Nice, sunny, warm Queensland where they make rum. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, you? Yeah, I'm in Albury, Rodonga, where it's actually the complete opposite. It's freezing cold, especially if the snowfields nearby and they don't make rum. <laughs> <laughs> so how does that how does that work from a professional year perspective? So like we've got different people at different stages during the professional year here and, and, and the, the, the first quarter at least from the professional year perspective is – is fairly like administration based, you know, time time on client files and and so forth. So how how does that work? And and how do you how do you propose the the latter part of the professional year where there's a lot more onus, onus on going to client meetings and presenting and running their meetings and, and that kind of thing? How have you planned on making that work with you 
the two of you in different parts of Australia? I think um, I'll jump on this, Jen, if that's okay. I think from our perspective, it was the, we have an advantage over everybody else in that uh, I was actually teaching as a lecturer at uh, CQU. And what we've done is, we were, yeah, what Angelique, Angelique McGuinness has taught us is that we use the same techniques that we use when teaching the students. So actually, it's Jan um, and give Jen all the support resources that she needs. So for us, it actually feels natural working remotely. And we just adapt all the business changes so that give Jen everything she needs to be able to do the job as anybody else with that in the office. Um, and basically treated uh, no different if we were based uh, Place. We keep the monitors on at all times. Um, we're there on hand to talk to each other, to be really frustrated, pull faces at the other person, and hit them that right knee off the camera off. Keep it as cultural as possible, yet professional, but we make it work. And we've delayed a part to it, so there's a lot of traveling involved. And we're just planning trips out. Uh, I've got New South Wales and Victoria. Jen's going to eventually have Queensland. And we're going to be bringing her down to where it is nice and cold so she can experience what it's like in Australia. And it's just planned trips uh, to do the face to face and go off the Bundaberg as well and help her. Basically, help her start to build up that point. Yeah. So, do you, just picking up on, so you, you mentioned you're kind of taking a, a, a teaching approach to, to the professional year, but then also just something you mentioned about you've got the, the, the screens on all the time. So, so the, the, the two of you have, like a Teams video call or something like that, just going the whole time, and and you and you're both on this so it, as if I don't know as if your colleague was sitting next to you in the office. That's the point. <laughs> is that what's going on? Yeah, yeah. what? You were yeah. keep zooming in the background. We um actually watched part of the video for our very first day. Um, mm. and Jeff, the house was going to go. Do I buy Zoom? And how both nervous and that we were, but it's to the point where it's uh. No different than an associate with you, James, sitting right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. How's that? Like, of course, that makes sense. Like, I want, like, whether I'm sitting in a, a little office room at the moment, recording recording this podcast with you, but but I just left a desk where there's someone sitting on that side and there's someone sitting on that side of me. But uh, yeah, to leave the Zoom going all day long, I know other, others do a, a bit of a check in in the morning and a check in in the evening. But why not have it going the whole time? Makes sense. Yep. So, so Daniel, can you maybe talk a bit about and and I'll get Jen to, to chime in as well. What is the like? What's the teaching approach to doing the professional year? How, like, how? What does that mean? How are you structuring that? Yep. So, uh, as I said before, I'm using the same technique and the like brings the section you, which focuses a lot on work integrated learning systems. So it's basically very hands on in a very realistic environment, and for us, it was really good because I was just transitioning from that. Environment from there to with Jen, um, there's no different from actually was actually learning from the university. Uh, we did have to make a lot of changes to make it uh, adaptable for Jen. Pretty much, how we were practice. We'll have that, but we just changed the way that we actually do things. Just change our systems. Uh, there's a lot of trial and error. And and Jen, what's what's your take on? On how it's going, I suppose you know you haven't experienced a professional week here somewhere else, so it might be a case of you don't know any different. But but are you seeing similarities in the way that you're engaging in the professional year now versus your studies at, at uni? Like, is there any similarities there? Not so far. I'm I'm still kind of easing into the the study aspect of the professional year. It's mostly it's been a lot of observing, final piloting. Um, Interacting with, starting to interact with clients, um, yeah, that sort of thing. But we are starting to look into the ethics side to, to prepare for the, the the exam. The exam you've got to do, yeah, that's the big one in uh, in quarter two. You can't can't pass quarter two until you <laughs> until you've done your exam. If, I think you'll be fine if you've just particularly if you've, if you've just done some studies. You've just yeah, city degree, muscle memory. I would imagine I'd imagine you're going to be fairly well prepared for that. Um, yeah, and I've got the best in the industry to teach me, so I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, Jim, what do you what do your clients look like? What are, so you're in different parts of Australia. Where are you, where do your clients where are your clients located? What do they look like? Can you talk a little bit about at, at that? At the moment, I'm meeting Dan's clients through Zoom. So when he meets a client, we just again keep the Zoom running and point the camera in that general direction, and I chat to the clients through the Zoom. And observe the meeting that way. 
the plan is to build up some clients up here, but that's going to take time. And so, Daniel, are, are, the, are the clients mostly around where you are? Like, are they fairly local to you, or is it you've got some dotted across the country? What, what's it? What's it like? Yeah. So, for my clientele, it's predominantly between um, cities in Melbourne. Uh, a lot of them is in the Albury region. They do have national clients as well as Canada. So, Zoom meetings that that's the app that's the big. Uh, a lot of the hands-on clients just face to face. They come into our office and look at it and probably can go So we just make sure that we've um we've got cameras and everything for Jen to actually see the uh overall picture of what's going on. Let her feel like she's part of it. The clients are actually really enjoying having Jen in doing that as well. Yeah. Uh, even the clients so are just you now comfortable with that Jen's there on the screen uh, watching as well. It's sort of a uh, yeah, join in have you know, joining the conversation with her, they try to include her as much as possible as we try to include Jen in to the meeting. And it's just become a natural dynamic now. If a client comes in and Jen's not on the screen, they uh, actually ask questions and make sure she's all right and everything. Yeah. So where is she? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, do, what, what, do, what do your typical clients look like? What, what What's a typical modern new financial planning client? Oh, uh, we are very holistic. So when a lot of advisors say, oh, we're holistic, we are actually really holistic. We don't specialize in anything, but we can specialize in everything. So I'll have clients come in that are really just starting in at their first job and everything to come out of university. But to uh, 80 year olds, she was like, um, you know, complex estate planning, uh, show you to pass on to their family and they move on. Uh, we pretty much take everything in play. And it's Good because the way we structured the business and the design that we could take that holistic approach, uh, apply all the standards um, to how you do business and then explore every avenue we can to provide the clients the opportunities that they want and the advice on looking for their journey. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. Now, you, you I, I noticed something that we were mentioned before we pressed record. You commented on um, on, a, on a post that link, on LinkedIn that Matt Hale had put up about estate planning uh, and, and you offered to to have a chat with what with what you're doing we do and and, and i suspect a, l- a lot of financial advisors they you know there's the standard oh you need to you should have wills and powers of attorney and make sure you've got your beneficiary nominations on your super funds those kind of things are, are you doing anything extra in that estate planning space other than, other than the stock standard well, so we uh because estate planning becomes the way we describe our months ballistic estate planning is the overall picture of what we're in. Uh, not so much, you know, the lifestyle that you want to live, what you want to protect, but how you going to pass it on or what it's going to be like for the next generation. So we try and factor that in as much as possible for it. We've got one strategy where we've got an elderly lady who had um, a fairly large sum of money in her in some old savings. And, for example, she when she passes away, she wants to pass it on to the grandchildren. Green shotting being aged between, say, 20 to 26, and the, the problem came, well, the chance came, they will be going to pass that money on without them actually spending the money in one lump sum. The testimony trust, you know, traditionally, most people go to testimony trust. What we created is she lost her looking for a couple of gamuts and income to support the watch still be tight. So we took an approach using the factor of the grandchildren and did a multi tier annuity or challenge up. And so from going at uh, one year term, a two year term, a three year term, spreading the money evenly, she's getting the benefits of the capital guarantee. She's getting the benefits of having the income coming in. But if she pulls it away, the children will get, the grandchildren will get all the money at the stages in their life, but the largest sum, lump sum amount being towards their parents, all the way they've got a little bit of um, money that to get them by help them through the grieving period uh, without the risk of them buying all the money to Place. Yeah. So, so can you talk me through how does that? How are the stages that they're getting the the, the money? Is that from maturity of the annuity at different points in time? So, from the maturity of the uh, yes, yeah, so at maturity of the annuity. So, if she dies in year one, you now we've got year one's worth coming within twelve months. Year two, within two years. Year three, and year three. When we come up to mature uh, time to renew the maturity. We then reassess and if it's late, uh, feasible, we just set year one to year three, three years one, and we just start rolling mature digging uh, witnesses that way. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, is there any particular structure around the conversations and Jen, you might, might 
know a little bit about this from sitting in on some of the meetings as well, but is, is there any particular structure around an estate planning conversation that you're that you're using with clients to try and flesh out these you know, these goals or aspirations from your clients? So what we do in that aspect is that we, we set it, basically set it at the very start. We put the framework into the client's mind that, yes, we're going to be having these conversations. But when we discuss the idealistic approach, we talk about every aspect. And as I said before, they planning basically draws the line for it all to come together. We let them know that. So by doing that, we say to them that uh, we're going to be asking really wonderful questions and they're not going to know what it is when we're asking you. So there's no surprises when I do start asking, start introducing those conversations into it. It's all like, oh, you've got a will, you've got a power attorney. How, how do you want your funds passed on? And once I start to get that, it's sort of a look up the order forward into more detail. Uh, it could be, in my aspect, uh, this emotional thought for a lot of clients, but because we're afraid of them to let them know that we're going to be asking, this clears the conversation quite nicely. Yep. Good job. Okay. Um, and, and so, Jen, what, you're obviously working through the professional year. L- longer term, what's, you know, what, what, what's the plans for Jen longer term? What's the plan for Jen long term? Well, around December next year, I'll be getting my AR and then I'm going to hit the ground running and take over the world. <laughs> um, I think that. What do you, hey, as a two of you, given any thought to, you mentioned uh, you know, trying to build out some clients around where you are in Bundaberg. Like, have you given any thought as to how you, you might go about doing that? Um, yeah. I'm, Dan and I have a saying, you're stuck with me. <laughs> so <laughs> we're not planning on. Yeah, I'm not planning on going anywhere. I know a lot of PYs tend to finish and move on. Um, that's not my plan at all. And, and in terms of finding clients around Bundaberg, what do you, do you do? You have any? I don't know, are you involved in sporting clubs or school things? A, a kinder like what, how 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 do you think you might go about doing that? Um, I'm going to pick the brain of my mentor sitting over there because he's brilliant at this sort of thing. Um, my thing's the numbers. He's the creative. <laughs> okay, he's the numbers as well. But yeah. Daniel, what do you think? <laughs> so I'm working with my mentor on this one, actually, Sharon Wolf. <laughs> well, absolutely fantastic help me, Jen. You know, all the come that base barriers that you get with uh, remote PY. Uh, and uh, pretty much where the show to you is that I'm going to be doing a lot of trips to Butterbag, which I'm, you know, where it's nice and warm and they have rooms and they have beaches and it's really not looking forward to that. No, it sounds, <laughs> sounds like you can't wait. <laughs> Everything's rough. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yes, I've been doing a lot of trips up there to basically uh, explode. We're building the modern year. I'm not a year, Jen's part of the modern year, so we're going to be going in to try and really help promote getting her out there. If, uh, modern year is very big in helping support um, local community of and local communities and local charities. So we've been using the same approach that we used in Norway with Ombre and Nolan. We'll start the numbers for the Gen and we'll get the interest and in generator been going through. Um, up in the White Bay area, and it's going to, uh, because we do like giving to the community, we are more of an educational practice where we learn the, uh, if I said if you were a people planner or a profit planner, we're a people planner of sorts, and doing seminars and just seeing what we can do to really help the Thunderbird community. Uh, so I think that's where Jen and I's, our greatest strength in everything we do is that we have a, a real passion to want to help people. Would you agree with that, Jen? Yeah, we are definitely values aligned. Yeah, sounds yep. like a sounds like you found the right place, Jen. That's for sure. Yeah, do you, definitely fell on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Daniel, are you still doing the lecturing at university? Are you still doing that as well? I am. I've been. Um, I've just begun now uh, this semester, so I'm doing the think one nine zero one nine zero two zero, which I call the Top Gun class. So Top Gun class. That's pretty much uh, well, that's what it is. You're the best of the best, and we just you know we take everything they get wide and we just pitch out a pilot plane. Um, so I'm teaching that one now with uh, at CTU. Uh, my colleague Andrew Lane is teaching the insurance side. Harry's and Wayne are teaching the state planning. So it's actually a lot of advisors lecturing at CTU. Yeah. And yeah, so I'm just teaching you know, what I'm just you know, all the holistic approach that you learn, all the components, we're putting it all together and showing them how every Thing that they've learned to that point does come together and financial advice to produce a SOA and 
Uh, to be honest with you, Jason, the quality that we see coming through the students, uh, the SOAs that they're producing from what they're learning, uh, I would actually match it to a lot of the advisors that I've seen in the class when used to do a lot of audits. That's fantastic. So is is there, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot written about declining advisor numbers. You know, all the people that have left it, financial advice over the last couple of years. Is is there people coming through the university system that have an interest in getting into financial advice? You know, you're you're doing a, some subjects in, in relation to that, but do you think there's a there's people coming through that have an interest, or is it only a a, a trickle that are coming out of the universities? So we suddenly said another's come up again. You know, it was a little bit my figure. It's it's good in one sense because uh, a lot with the decline in the end with the financial service industry was all the changes and everything. And we've got people coming in now that want to be advisors that want to help people, that are passionate to join our profession. And it's because we're now surrounded by a lot of advisors that stay in the industry that are passionate. So we're kind of leading that example. Everything you're doing, like we've done some bulk with you, James, where if you put on social media and that, we've actually now uh, brought in, we're attracting new needs come to because they want to be just like us and see what we do because we're still here. Yeah, it's interesting. You've mentioned that. So, you know, some of the videos and things that are put in different places, I'm actually noticing that there are, you know, there have been multiple, not like this, hundreds of them, but there have been multiple occasions when people are asking me, what did you do? How did you get into the industry? How do I become a financial advisor? These kind of questions. So, And they tend to be coming from younger people. Yeah, so maybe there's a, there is increasing interest in, uh, in it because we could – Desperately need more financial advisors and more people like you, Jen, going through the through the PY. Whether they're a straight out of high school, or whether they're doing it a little bit later after having a family. But um, I guess the biggest problem with the with my end of the entering the industry is that there is a lack of a clear pathway. So it's it's all good and well to want it, but what do you do after the degree? That is becoming clearer over time, but it was murky for a while. You were kind of lucky in in the role that you picked up because of the studies you were doing in your Sydney Dan. But then, um, yeah, like here, most people start off in a client services team. So they'll, they'll, or they might get a job as an associate advisor if they're coming in as a, they've got a little bit, little bit more life experience behind them rather than a 21 year old fresh out of university. They might go into an associate advisor role, but that tends to be the pathway that we have here client services team or associate advisor. It's they very much a little it depends and become, type of situation. <laughs> it does, absolutely, depending on which business you end up in, whether it's a smaller business, whether it's a bigger business. And as you said, life experience makes a difference as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, the associate advisor that I just had, he is he's, uh, he's moved on, but um, he bounced around a whole lot of different jobs before getting into financial advice and his life experience showed in the – in the work that he was doing, it was you know, different to it as a 21-year-old just straight out of university. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Jen, good to have you in the industry. I think Daniel's lucky. He's got a, he's got a good one there. So. <laughs> oh, he's very lucky. <laughs> well, listening, you're not to approach Jen. She's like, <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm <laughs> finish, the pod- <laughs> finish the podcast, but... By saying recruiters stay away, she's <laughs> she's she's taken. It's and very happy in in our role. So good on you that the, the the two of you are making it work. And I think if anyone could take anything from this, that and people heading through the professional year, it doesn't. You don't need to be employing people that live in the same city or town as you that can attend the same office as you. I guess it does need to be made clear though that it work. remote doesn't just happen. It is work. It, yeah, it is something you have to work at. It's it's work. You have, to, but the two of you clearly have made it work as well. Um, yeah, it, it could have it could have not, but you both adapted. As you said, it was a bit weird in the beginning having the Zoom running the whole time, but uh, but hey, it works for you. So I think there's a there's a bit of value in that for anyone that might be listening as well. We will uh, release a video of our first days to everyone a couple of years down the track, so everyone can see what it was really like to build the work. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you've got that recorded the first day. You can uh, well, we'll both uh, very nervous, but look back and chuckle on it later on. When once you've taken over the east coast of Australia, as you said, once it yeah, yeah, <laughs> might release that to the world. Good on you. Well, great to speak with you both. 
appreciate you joining me on such late notice and uh, see you soon. Thank you for having us.